Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the December 14th Fine Scale Live Build. This will be our last show of 2017. Uh, looking forward to a, to a 2018 show. So we're going to do the last prep stuff we have to start off the new year right. Miles and I are going to have a discussion, a little bit about road construction uh, and urban scenery integration. Uh, I think Miles and I, many of us modelers, uh, have kind of the same pet peeves or list of pet peeves like many many hundreds of tons or thousands of tons structures that float in the air that's not an uncommon sight on model railroads and a very sad sight to see a beautiful structure do that and the key to planting that is road and sidewalk construction that's the the key element in my opinion in, in any urban scenery um, so in just a moment we'll get into our discussion about that and then we're going to build a section of road uh, using a, a quite tried and true method uh, we'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, we'll pause for a station identification by Johnny, if you will, please, sir. All right. Well, I want to say go to utmallbuilders.com. There you can check the schedules for the uh, Tuesday and Wednesday shows. Those are aired at uh, 8 o'clock Central, 9 o'clock Eastern Time. And the uh, Thursday night show and the once a month uh, live show with Big Bill and Barry. Or aired at 9 o'clock Central, 10 o'clock Eastern Time. So be sure and tune in and check the uh, website for changes in the schedule. Uh, also, uh, while you're there, be sure and click on the email and uh, sign up for an email notification when it comes out. The next issue should be coming out about the mid January, somewhere around that mark. So be on the lookout for that. And. Uh, We've kind of had a little turnaround this month, being December, uh, so you not having a Thursday night Johnny Mall Train talk show. We're putting the Andy's Fine Scale show up tonight because of uh, people's travel times and all during the month for Christmas. So hope you enjoy the show and turn it back over to Andy. It gets a little busy for all of us in this time period, so we work through it. What's going on with you, Miles? Well, outside of messing up about two nights ago and then having a better show, I think, last night, nothing. No, I actually, I've been changing around. You know, we, both of us say, we have to say sometimes that we learn from our mistakes. I have wired three peninsulas of my railroad that are off to my right here, including this one. And I had something like 25 or 30 switch machines off of one um, 300 amp 12 volt Radio Shack transformer. And I got to the end a couple days ago, wired the last one in, and it just didn't want to throw. And I thought maybe there was something wrong with my switches, but no, it wasn't that. I put 12 volts to it, it worked great. So this afternoon, I spent the time going in and breaking my bus up. And I now have three transformers, one for each peninsula, and yep. everything's working great. So, you know, sometimes you have to back up and redo. It's not my favorite activity, but. It all works, so it was worth it. I don't think any of us love the wiring stuff. And I'm an electrical engineer by training, work in the technology space, and, and I don't love the wiring part. That's why I'm so excited about the dead rail movement. And I'm kind of preempting to go dead rail on my land, even though it's not easy to do just yet. Uh, but there's some sacrifices, but, but that's the future. Uh, and this wiring stuff is just, uh, can really get difficult in places. I'm really glad that I have my layout wired because that means that I can charge my S cabs anywhere they go on the railroad. But if I get a short, I don't worry because the engine will just continue right on running. Yeah, and I'm going to do a similar thing. I have to wire mine for block occupancy purposes anyway. So why not go ahead and have the ability to put power there? But my power requirements, uh, if I was doing strict uh, rail to, to equipment, uh, power for everything that I'd have to have a lot of segmented blocks and isolation and I, I don't have to do that complexity so I'm looking forward to some things get get simpler I mean, we get better methods I mean talking about roads today that that's changed considerably in the ways I used to use it and, and while I often use you know some fairly modern techniques and very little plaster I'm not a fan of plaster whatsoever I haven't found a great substitute for creating roads 
uh, especially curvy wide. And I've tried a few things, uh, even included actually, I'll take the camera loose and show you. I made a road using uh, a technique uh, Kit Patterson showed off doing, uh, I made the, this road going along the back section back there. And I made a few other segments of that road using um, concrete patch, vinyl concrete patch. Um, it's not a bad technique. And especially for background roads, I would use it again. Uh, it's these foreground roads that are that are right up in your foreground eye, where you or right up in your eye, where where the fine scale level that that I that I try for and, and you know try to achieve when I can um, doesn't seem to that does it doesn't satisfy me of that requirement. Uh, I've watched some of your uh, video that you put out on some of the roads you've done. What kind of techniques have you? Have you kind of fell in love with using? Well, well, well the first, first, the first, the first time, time I ran into, ran into it was in, was in Atlanta, Atlanta. Atlanta, and I was and working I, for Atlanta Models and Exhibits, and we had to do a model of downtown Atlanta with the Coke building, and that was the first time that I encountered using styrene, sheet styrene, and the guys there literally came in with a four by eight sheet of about yeah. thirty thousand styrene. And we took a template and laid out all the roads and all the streets in this given, I think, probably about two or three block area and cut them all out. And then our foam base that we were mounting on was machined with a, a router that could do three dimension. And we actually laid the road just like this masonite into the foam. Yeah. And of course, that was all painted. We, we striped it. We lined it. We weathered it. We did everything to it. Although... It was supposed to be an architectural model, so it was very little weathering. It had to look kind of new. Yeah. But that was the first time I encountered the styrene. I really like the styrene for city streets because you're talking about smooth concrete that's machined. And unless it's in really bad shape, as many of our roads are, but nonetheless, unless you want to represent a really bad city street, you want it to be pretty even level whatever you can put your weathering lines in your oil drippings that kind of stuff your tire marks but you want it to be pretty smooth and even and that's what i did i showed that on we can walk over here and i'll, I'll change um, change the camera to the back side so you can see if i don't trip here and go around um let me change the camera to the other side there we go this is the street that i did then on train masters and you can see here the edge of the well, let's see here the edge of the street, and I'll get down maybe a little closer. You can see my striping. I've got a, a stop mark here before we get to the we get out a further the tracks. Uh, I've got all my curbs in over there on the far side. Got a milk truck, got a moving van moving a house down the road, but the sidewalks are off over here, and I've got my telephone loose laid down. But I think all oh, this detail is really messy because I've been working in here. But I've got a, the old-fashioned elevator coming up out of the street. Those are made oh, by yeah. Bar Mills. He, he makes them in every scale. Uh, I've got trash cans there and dogs at the trash and parking meters. Um, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Larry Deal, my buddy here in Kansas City, who was an architect, uh, told me they put fire plugs about every 300 feet, I believe it is. They put parking meters about every... Uh, 20 feet sure. and put telephone poles at the rate of about every hundred. Yeah. And sometimes I'll put the telephone poles a little closer, but I try to kind of adhere to that 20 feet for the parking place and especially the parallel parking like that or the parallels for the curb parking. Um, and I pretty much try and put a fire plug every 300 feet or so, but then the scale feet. But then that's still, depending on the size of your layout and the size of your street scene, you know, you may want to go more often in order to make make it look more believable. Sorry, I got the hiccups. Uh, <laughs> yeah, look, sort of selective compression. I do that with telephone poles. I slightly shrink that distance down to more like 80-ish scale feet, even though it's not exactly prototype to, to dimension. It's not to mention era changes some of these things, too, and I'm modeling a, a historic era. 
But even in 1950, 100 feet would have been the fairly standard practice. But it looks like a longer distance to you if you see a, a, an extra telephone pole or two in an area. So Well, and lots of times, too, you'll see a pole at the entrance to an alley because they would be running along the street, but they would also turn and go down that alley. So you might find them more often, you know, than every 100, depending on the necessity of the utility to run its lines in a given direction. Because... They didn't run them underground, you know, back in the 40s and 50s. They were all above ground lines. Oh, absolutely. And you've seen a lot of them uh, today. If you look at, there's a lot of changes. And, and I've spoken with us about this before. It's really hard to model a historic era, you know, back 1950s, nearly 70 years. A lot has changed in the world. And today, if you go along the right of way, there's not a power line there at all. But back in my era, there was in many places two or three, one on either, you know, two or three separate sets of, of wiring. There was one on either side of the right of way through here. And what I think they had is is common utility uh, for houses up to a certain point. And then they had the railroads telegraph and power for theirs on a separate set of poles on the opposite side of the right of way. Uh, what do you got, Johnny? No, we got one comment from uh, Chris R. Uh, back when you're talking about the roads, he said, what about use of satellite photos of roads like Miles has suggested before? Yes. I was fascinated with his idea that that's, that's spectacular. That's just itching to be bottled there that you've got, Miles. Yeah, that's I, I, every time I go into some of these smaller mid-sized towns, I photograph these alleys because they're pole arrangements down alleys are just spectacular. And the detail that you can get with just some lines and some some pole insulators, just really, I mean, to me, it's fascinating how they did it. But, and uh, I bought quite a few 3D parts. Take your camera with you and shoot some, shoot some pictures. Oh, absolutely. Well, I mean, and most of us, you know, most of us, the, the thing that a lot of people tend to forget, is you got a photo, a camera with you all the time. So I take pictures like, I, I was, uh, Never did I take crazy amounts of pictures, nor do I post a lot of selfies on Facebook even today. But I take pictures like crazy. Everything I find the least bit interesting, I, there, it's nothing to take pictures, and it's so uh, valuable as a modeling reference, even if your era is different. Uh, there's plenty of things that are still done similar. Uh, and 3D printing seems to be the source for like power line creation. Um, I've been making my poles out of skewers because they're just about identical to the right size at HO scale. They're ever yeah. so slightly overscaled, but if anything, that overscale looks good. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, a lot of these doorways and some of the windows and stuff that I use in my Photoshop big buildings, those are not the windows in those buildings. Those are windows from Emporia, Kansas or Jefferson yeah. City, Missouri or someplace, because I'll go along and get just as square as I can to that door or that window, shoot a picture of it, and then I can take and drop it into any building. And sometimes, I, you know, I, if I find a, a window that's just demolished, but I want to backdate it to back to the 40s and 50s when that window was good, I'll go back in my repertoire of windows. I've got a file on my computer that says windows, and yeah. I'll go through there and find one. I've got one that says doors. I've got one that says freight doors. So I can go through my files and I can find something that will fit what I want and drop it in. Well, the art of replication is is an art for that very reason. It's not an exacting. Uh, and like I've, I've said before, you can be a prototype modeler of a, a truly a true to point prototype modeler if you're modeling a piece of rolling stock or a single structure on a diorama or something. If you're a layout builder, and that's what I, I care about, and I try to do as high fidelity, and that's why I tend to use the terms high fidelity as opposed to fine scale for nomenclature regions, but or prototype. I don't tend to call myself prototype per se. It's more that I'm looking for the closest to, to feeling like you're replicating something, but I've got a whole layout to build, and it can't be prototypical. It just It's just not possible. I try to get close, but it's, it's approximation. It's flavor. Yeah, exactly. So I've done roads out of a, a few things, and I've tried about every technique that has come around when it comes to roads. And for country roads and city roads, very, very different opinions about what works the best there. Um, I used uh, that uh, material, that that concrete patch, vinyl concrete patch. It's a great material. Build up a couple of forms out of some some square stock, uh, you know, eighth inch or, or, or you know, five sixteenths or something square stock. Build up a form, uh, big putty knife 
lay it down. You do have to sand it quite a bit. Uh, something people don't take account is that in, in HO scale, let alone in scales smaller at end scale or something, but even at HO scale, any texture you have that's on par with sand or something is much closer to gravel. So a concrete road's texture has to be, it has to be, uh, <laughs> yes, tiny. and it, it basically, and I'm a big believer in texture, in, in, in being able to use light to your advantage, to model with light, to model with shadows, and, and etc. Uh, so much so that I, I love what Charles Kirk has done by painting shadows into his scenery, uh, and, and I'm a believer that that's, that's absolutely great. But when it comes to, to roads, the kind of texture that you need in concrete is just not coarse enough for anything other than paint techniques. Uh, I've well, seen some people spray painting, misting spray paint to get some color techniques that look good. The other thing you can do too is do your <clears throat> concrete patch or plaster. I, I do plaster because I, I, I'm used to that. We both, we all model with what works for us. But yep. rather than paint it, stain it. If you come in with a very light mix of uh, black, touch it with a little white to get a black, a kind of a grayish stain that will come very close to the very light color of concrete and stain it because then you'll maintain that crystallization that that really fine texture of the plaster or the vinyl patch and right your paint sometimes will smooth that out and make it too smooth you're back to my styrene look but if you can maintain that plaster surface by staining it you can maintain the the, the texture of the scale oh absolutely i i totally agree <laughs> Uh, any kind of a latex or acrylic paint that would have a, a, a particulate pigment to it is going to fill in gaps and smooth that road surface out. It, it's going to naturally self-level and smooth right. some of the things out. And I'm absolutely, uh, and I've went on to using a lot of different kinds of stains these days from alcohol-based stains for, for, for the wood products and stuff. But I, I intend to just use India ink. Uh, that'll be just fine yeah. for this. Just realized I hadn't dropped my curtains. I've been doing wiring, so my layout looks like heck right now. <laughs> well, I need to get around to my curtains right away. I've got them covering my window until I do my backdrop up behind me now, but I've got the curtains for around the bottom of the layout too. And that's a, a very soon project for me. I also bought some some, uh, some carpet tiles recently. I yeah. think those are the bee's knees for a, a layout room. You don't need carpet under the layout and it's so easy to drop your bucket of plaster while you're working and that's carpet that's 20 by 20 tiles throughout the entire of the railroad you can see i think i've got no you can't see it i'll move the chair a little bit uh, i've got concrete down there and then tile but the tile is six inches or so beyond the curtain so you don't know that the whole thing's not tiled and if you right, that's what I'm say is if i stain it or whatever i just go get another tile put it in place Right. And a few, t and you only need a few tiles to cover an aisleway, whereas, you know, if you had carpet, you have carpet under the entire room. Hi, Ralph. Welcome. So, so, and, and I have, uh, I've done plaster roads the old fashioned way, like I did with the, uh, uh, with the concrete patch, you know, build up forms, pour and scrape uh, plaster into it. That's how I've done it years and years ago on plywood surfaces. We did that a lot. But there's some considerations that, that me and Ralph talking about the other day in, in that a lot of my road surfaces are, are up and down. They have a lot of vertical changes through various layers or laminates of styrofoam. But that's not always the best surface to try to fill up with plaster. You end up filling up a bunch of holes with it because I've got these old patches. So Ralph was talking about filling it with uh, and basically just using plaster that will soak into the top surface of a piece of cardboard. Uh, let me show you the piece of cardboard I've got one second. But the, I also tried one other technique uh, first. I tried this maybe a year or two ago before I did the concrete patch. Uh, and I didn't get the results. Like you were saying, you use the techniques that work for you. And I see other people use uh, foam core. And I'm a huge fan of the stuff. Absolutely huge fan of the stuff. Use it. In my roadbed, use it in all kinds of things. I'm allowed to build dioramas with, with, those, with that base. Although I'm probably going to move to gator foam soon, but I've been using foam core a lot. But I've tried making roads with this stuff, and I tip them in with it. And I'm not positive whether or not I would be satisfied with them in the background, but I have not been satisfied with them as foreground roads. So far, I've tipped in these couple roads with foam core so I can build up to it, basically using them as a form. 
and build up by cedary slopes and by my shoulders up to the sides of the road by wrapping it in cellophane and building these roads that shoot around down and curve around and, and back there but they have uneven uneven surfaces that i need the road so the, i think the cardboard technique is gonna gonna work quite well because it'll let me have this uneven surface that i can build these you know graded roads because that's got quite a bit of a grade on it as it drops down several several layers of styrofoam on that one so i'm going to start and i want to get this area prepped uh behind me for the structures that we've built in the previous shows i've got a little plastic structure laid up there now move before i knock it over uh, i've got the the kit from imagine that laser art that we put together and i, I built a, a sloped roof on it because it matches the prototype that i i need to model for the old shirt factory in, in st paul but down in front, there's a series of buildings that go along here. Very little of the road is actually modeled. So, so, so tonight I was going to use. I've cut a piece. I've cut a piece of cardboard to make, not just as a form. My original plan was to use it as a form, build up the the forms on the side of it, much like I did the other uh, roads. But I'm going to soak this in plaster, basically, and and build this city street out of a piece of cardboard that's that's cut to match, cut to match the area I'm working in. It also gives me some elevation, and that's something we don't take into account. You know, years and years ago, when I was quite young, building a road, the idea of building a road was was you know, you know, a strip of gray paint or a strip of black paint. Come back to our coloration uh, thoughts here in just a minute, but uh, was a strip of black paint across the green plywood, and I had a road. That's you know, uh, Hot Wheels, and you know, paint it black, throw some Hot Wheels on it. I was a happy little kid. Uh, my ideas of roads have, have have changed and you you know there's slopes and grade profiles much like our prototype railroad has they may have changed but you're still a happy little kid i, I am a happy <laughs> i am a happy kid i try to be happy um so what's your thoughts on materials i know you you i've talked about this plaster technique that i'm working with tonight and and uh, I'm generally not a fan of plaster just because I don't like working with it, but I haven't found anything great. And I, uh, one other technique I tried was Mike Coffalone's uh, using vinyl spackle. That is a, and I built a diorama when I was first experimenting with the styrofoam. The spackle works great, but it's got, it's a vinyl compound. So carving uh, expansion gaps in it and such, and all the little curb lines and stuff, it, it just doesn't. If, if anything, it, you either get much too large of a gap to actually make it, uh, to create it or it chips off it comes off a little chunks and breaks off so but the one thing about spackle is it doesn't crack when it dries if you use just plaster which yep. a lot of people refer to plaster as drywall mud different drywall stuff. mud as plaster yep. that will yep. crack to no end you'll you'll be oh, yeah. filling right. gaps forever yeah so shrinks. the idea the ideal product to use is uh, a finishing plaster that they put on drywall called Durabond 90. Yep. 90 stands for an hour and a half of working time. So you can do all your carving and so on while it's still in the damp format and level it out and put in cracks if you want. Sure. Um, but if you use foam core, the worst thing about foam core is once you re remove that paper layer from the top to get that foam so you can make impressions in it, yep. that's the problem with it. It's too delicate. Yeah. Anything falls on it, you're going to leave an impression. Yeah, I mean, even pressing your thumb in it as you're holding it and working on it. I, I started messing with it and cutting the expansion gaps that I needed in it. Just where I pressed my thumb down, there's a spot on here, I don't know where, but a spot where I pressed my thumb down as I held it, and that left an indentation that's, yeah. you know, size of a thumb, not, not prototypical. So my, my thoughts are two. Uh, actually, there's three uh, materials. One of them is the same material you use for framing pictures, mat board. Yeah. And if you dampen it when you put it down, you can get it to do compound curves. You can get it to do this because it stretches. When it dries, it'll stay in that position. You put sandbags on it to hold it while it's drying. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, hang on a sec. The other thing is uh, styrene. And if it's thick enough, you can cut grooves in it with the back of a number 11 blade, and they're not going to be really thick grooves because a number 11 blade point is kind of uh, very thin. Sure. And the other product was, and I saw uh, Sterling, the, I forget the guy's name, I think it was Craig, uh, Sterling Models at one of the fine scale expo shows. And he used corrugated cardboard and he compressed the cardboard so the corrugation was gone, which gave yeah. that cardboard some flexibility. So he put that down on his layout, cut to the way he wants the, the road. Um, and then he dampens it and puts the Durabond on top of it. I was fascinated with that idea of doing it. Much easier than building forms and, and trying to pour plaster between the forms. This also deals with my problem where I have some open gaps in sections under the road that I would have to fill up with something, adding to yep. the weight. Um, so, Johnny, you have some more stuff from us from YouTube? Yeah, yeah. We, uh, uh, Chris R., uh, the other thing you need to do with uh, concrete is put cracks in it. Concrete will always be uh, cracked, especially due to the weather and age. Uh, Brian has asked anyone use ply bond or hot glue for road as tar. And let's see. I could see using hot glue to patch in sections, but I've yeah. done pretty good just mixing a little bit of adhesive and paint together, uh, like a, a, PL, a PLA glue, like white glue or something. A little bit of paint makes it hard for that. Yeah, a right. uh, couple of them here, I'm just going to list out what they were saying they've been using. One thing is, uh, Andrew down in Australia, Andy said, you need to take a breath, you're turning blue. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I could go a long time. <laughs> he does. But Andrew said that he uses plaster plus 25% wood glue. Uh, Rod's trains of things, uh, dry mud and plaster are quite different things. Ron Boyd said use, uh, he's using a uh, finishing plaster. I found that to work best. That's the Dur that's the Durabon. The finishing yeah. plaster is the Durabon. And Brian <laughs> said yes, we use a uh, hot mud, Ralph. Except this fifteen to thirty minute is mentioned. You you can get it in different different grades. Uh, there is the fifteen thirty. You can get it in an hour. You can get it in ninety minutes. The 90 minute one is, is the easiest one because of the longest open time yeah. or working time. And uh, Chris again was just saying uh, use pencil or a marker method for the uh, patches. That's what we discussed the other night. Uh, and and you, you're not happy with that, Andy. I, I said you get yourself a fine tip uh, uh, like a Sharpie, but don't get it in that jet black. You can get it in a sort of a gray. But in a lot of yes. cases, they use jet black tar just to pour it on the cracks. Sure. To seal it. It'll lighten, up, it'll lighten up slightly over time. It, you know, the sun will bleach it. Some water dirt gets on it, dust gets on it. It's still going to be pretty doggone black, though. But I, th I think that's going to be your easiest way to go. Uh, but then I know you don't do things the easy way, so. <laughs> I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of a hard way to get it. I look, the cracks look great on what Miles has got up on camera. Exactly. Well, this, this was came from um, oh, just lost it from Bob Lundy who oh, started DPM models and Magnuson models years ago. What he does, he takes two pieces of styrene, and this hole is located O scale, uh, eighth of an inch, which is six inches, but it had to be a sixteenth and H O scale. But I can put this up; it's just like a T square against my curb. Put my five half millimeter pencil in here, my Eversharp. And I run it along, and that gives me my curb line yep. all the way down the curb. And then my sidewalk cuts are about six feet. I think this is an inch and a half square. So I make one mark here, then I start here, and then I just slide over and make marks all the way down my, my thing. But he really liked that half millimeter pencil. I think it looks great because it's very subtle. Uh, it doesn't stand out. And just dominate things. Let's see if I can get one over here. So, Miles, what's your base material? It's styrene, is it not? Star yeah, this is styrene. Uh -huh. I'm doing city streets, so I'm I'm holding to the styrene method. But yeah, wow, that's a mess. Uh, there, now you can see I've got 
lines every once in a while. I'll come back in. I've masked off for the parking places. And I they, see you've got raccoons in your neighborhood. Yes, yeah, they've knocked over the trash knocked can. Knocked over the trash can. And I've got, I've got the, um, I've got the, yeah, i got the old fashioned uh, <laughs> elevators coming up out of the street. Out of the street, yeah. I love the street elevators. I wish they had the where I bought. Like I'd love to bottle some, but they weren't there. So, but I really you can like bottle really anything like you want. want. Whoops! Look. There we go. I really like the um, the pencil it, because it's so subtle. That the danger is with that pencil is that you get carried away. If you just go crazy with it, but yeah, I still like it. But the roads were somewhat rough, not not ancient city, uh, you know, uh, city streets, or you know, they're not, you know, uh, they're functional operational roads with the with the gaps. But from the pictures I can see, say, and I, I've got a lot more pictures from the late fifties than I do from the early fifties. But the gaps were somewhat wide. Some of the expansion gaps they had. And dirt and grass growing through some of the, you know, especially along the street edges. There's a lot of grass. Uh, there's a lot of trash that gets piled up in those. So I thought it'd be easier for me to recreate the action that I wanted, especially planting uh, uh, leaves and pieces of newspaper and stuff. If there was an actual indentation there, I'm not stuck on that. And I'm not sure that's an absolute requirement to do, but with plaster, I could, I could go either way. And I'm not against styrene. I've even seen uh, some people use plexiglass. A lot of the uh, architectural modelers uh, seem to argue in favor of plexiglass, painted plexiglass. But that's a lot harder to work with. Exactly. And and the issue with using plexiglass for any sort of concrete is that it's too hard a material yeah. to put score lines into. That was my fear as well. It's tough. Uh, the, the nice part about styrene, if you have the right tools to do it, you can use a number 11 blade or you can use one of those uh, uh, plastic cutters that, that looks like that. Um, these follow nicely on styrene if you got a nice straight edge. On plexiglass, if you wander slightly, you've screwed it up completely. Yeah. It takes off and goes. And I don't think I would love, I, I, and a lot of this has to do with, with whatever technique works the best for you. And as you guys know, I don't love working with plexiglass of glass, I don't, or plastic rather, uh, styrene. I don't even love working with plaster. I just haven't found another good technique. And I've got some material from Monster Modern Works. Actually, let me screen share it. I'll show you this stuff that, um, and I'm not sure that I won't use their material for my sidewalks. Um, there, there. It's a wood material. It's it's going to be. It'll work really well if I do choose to do it to, or or I may just use styrene to make the sidewalks and lay right back on top of this plaster. The wood you'll takes be, color. You'll, you'll be disappointed. I mean, it's a good idea, but you'll be disappointed. The reason I say that is because in that area where you have the the breakout, where the like on that upper piece there. Where the breakout is, where any, anything is missing, it's flat. Because it's only cut to a certain depth, and that depth carries from one edge to the other. Whereas okay. when you do it with your knife, you have all these variable depths that you put into it. Sure, sure. So and the lack I'm of consistency. I'm not, I'm not trying to knock his product. It depends on how much detail you want and how far you want to go. Right. And, well, knowing, and I'm not knowing you. Yeah. <clears throat> that I, that I, knowing me, I probably want to go just a little too far. So I have a tendency to. But I like the control of color that you get with most of these techniques that we've talked about. Um, the concrete patch is pre-colored. Again, it's great for background roads where you're, or, or if you're not as concerned. If you don't want to put expansion gaps, you don't want to carve gaps in it, you can put it on there and sand it and get a great finish. It's also flexible. It's a vital material, so it stays flexible. Spackle has a pretty doggone similar properties in my book, uh, but it's not good for carving into. Uh, I don't think it'd be good for making hard edges like what we need for our sidewalk material, but I've used plaster for a lot of years. 
Um, while I'm not at all a fan of working with plaster, generally speaking, I, I know I can get the results I wanted. This is a fairly easy area to work with. It's mostly straight. It's got a slight tip up, uh, you know, slight grade going up as it goes across the cross, grade crossing across the roadbed here um, and such. It's, it's a fairly simple section to the edge of the layout. Most of these other roads I've got, they dip tremendously and, and go up and down grades and, and go around. You know, Appalachian roads are uh, a, a unique uh, experience. Uh, if you drive around in, in Appalachian, especially true on the back roads or what would have been the main roads in 1950. You know, they old adage is somebody slapped a goat on the butt and paved wherever it went. So and it feels hey, kind of true. I'm going to share a screenshot with you. This is. Um... This was done. This was done for a model that I did. Where'd it go? Stop sharing. I guess I shared the wrong screen. It's going crazy. Yeah. <clears throat> and that's styrene. Oh yeah. That's all, okay. all the cuts and breaks and so on. We're done. We're we're done with the number eleven blade. Yeah, that works. The thing is, you can paint it any color you want. You can stain it any color you want, and you can make it look like it's faded out. Like this here was supposed to be a a, a battery charging spot for a futuristic car. So, you can do all kinds of stuff with the styrene more than you can do with what you wanted to do with the um, the cardboard or the plaster. Yeah. I'm not sold on the on the wood material yet, so I'm going to work with some of the plaster. I'm going to go ahead and start mixing some up and, and plaster this road material in place and see. I'm going to, I have to pin it down because especially now that I've got it wet, it kind of curls up a little bit. So pin it down around the outsides, and I think it'll be, I think it'll stay still long enough for me to work with it. This is kind of an odd spot, though. Most of the road goes off the edge of the layout. So it's kind of an odd spot. There's not a lot of the road actually modeled. There'll be a couple structures here. Uh, this structure is kind of cut by the fascia, so maybe a good spot to model the interior of the structure. Now, and another argument I see, or, or another argument I have with what I see a lot of modelers do, is their roads are just are just don't look like what I see roads looking like. And I'm sure this has to do with geography, because I used to live out west, and I see roads that were, you know, were quite red, uh, you know, due to the color of sand that they choose to use. But the concrete roads, the old old roads that we have, they're they're not far from being white. They're not white. They're definitely a gray color. They're distinctly gray, but they're considerably lighter than than what I see people model most of the time. Always remember the Puccio axiom, Mother Nature weathers to neutral gray. And they're really in a well-weathered road. There's very little difference between the gray of asphalt and the gray of concrete. That's right. Yeah, I've heard, we've talked about that argument too a little bit. And I don't, I don't I don't say and after all the pictures I've looked at of these, I don't see that much distinction. Actually, it seems to be quite hard for me to tell the difference in concrete <laughs> versus asphalt. If it weren't for seeing expansion gaps, I wouldn't know that some of these roads were originally concrete. Yeah, it's amazing. It really is. The only thing I can say is that it's all made out of natural stone of one form or another. So you kind of figure they'd all get to the same place. That was done with with uh, picture frame matting. So mat board, which is not that far removed from the task board stuff that a lot of modeling companies use, right, to build structures out of. It's pretty similar. To that. Yeah, pretty much the same. Or what do they call it? Uh, strat, strat, straticona? Uh, I forget. Some, some Strathmore. Strathmore. That's it. <laughs> That's the company brand. that makes it. Right, that's a brand of it, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Miles. But I was hoping the concrete that the that this 
cardboard would change. I really like the result that you get with plaster roads. I just, I really love that result. I hadn't seen anything that was, now the spackle was close to as good, but just, it did hardly win me over. You know, everybody knows me knows I'm not really that picky, but in this case, it just wasn't really? hard. Okay, I'm, I'm <laughs> off the picky. But it wasn't hardly there, you know, and, and that's, for all modelers, for everybody watching, you model for you. I, I don't care what anybody else does right. or doesn't. You model the technique that you enjoy doing. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sure there's a few things we do, like we were talking about at the onset of doing a little wiring. We don't love wiring, but our trades require electricity, so we suffer through it to enjoy the hobby as a whole. You may love a, a technique, but there's a lot of choices of technique. So find a technique that you don't, that you either don't hate doing or that you enjoy doing. And I don't love working with plaster. It's it's messy. It's time sensitive. It's it's just and not you have dirty. to wear latex gloves. That's Poor right. Boy. It's so dirty. I don't like getting dirty. Oh man, I love it. <laughs> well, for anybody who wasn't around recently, that's been the running joke. As 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 I've had to sneak around to use my little uh, artist blade uh, to put my uh, scenery coop down since. Uh, uh, since Ralph started giving me a hard time for not doing it with my hands. And I did give it a shot, but I wore latex gloves. Uh, I don't love getting that dirty. The paint's Miles, hard. Miles, we're, we're talking about sculpt mold sculpt mold has got to be the, the most therapeutic material to work with. And he had to wear latex gloves. Yeah. What can I say? <laughs> And it was still messy. Well, it's got glue in it. What do you want in plaster? You know? Hey, we do have soap and water. I you can wash up afterwards. Actually. And it's a pretty fast technique to do it that way. I will have to say it's quite quick. If, I, if I'm if i doing a big area, using the your tree hands, trunk. The tree trunk is sculptable. That's right. Is that nice. right? Is that gorgeous or what? I mean, I don't know if I did it or not, but yeah, sculptable. Well, it has a nice texture to it, too, which would kind of look like, because uh, it's particulate, you know, it's paper, cellulose paper. So if it peels off a little bit, it looks like bark peeling. Yeah. That would make sense to me. That's right. This is Kentucky, so you can't just rule that question out. That's right. Yeah, we still we got we got a little water. So there's so, always like a lot of people. Oh, so uh, you're saying you do have indoor plumbing? You can wash your hands. I can totally wash my hands. Yes. Okay. Okay. So then there's no excuse. We're quite proud of our indoor plumbing around here. Yeah, that, no pump panel, that pump panel at the sink, that's a real innovation. <laughs> I think he missed it. Yeah, he's ignoring me on that one. <laughs> oh, I'm quite happy to, to have it. I can wash my hands. I can do all that stuff. You know, the uh, consideration, though, is, and I've known plenty of people who could not paint. They ended up with, uh, I, I couldn't afford for them to paint because they'd waste a quarter of a gallon get on them, you know. After they were done, I'd have to take them and roll them along the wall and some of the paint off. Uh, some people just get it all over me. It seems like every time I touch plaster, I get it on me. I get, it ends up, you know, being a mess. You don't have to wear good clothes to do it. See, there he is with his palette knife again. I got a paintbrush. <laughs> I like tools. I mean, our opposable thumbs have to be of some value. <laughs> so we haven't we haven't uh, figured out what's going to be best for you. But I guess we're not going to do that. It's going to have to come from you. How's that? Well, to decide which method is the best for you. I know. I've tried. I've tried several. 
Uh, I've used plaster and I just don't like working on plaster very well. And even though I love the results of plaster, I, I, I hate doing it so bad that I, I'm reluctant to use that. I think this the cardboard may change my mind a little bit about it because it gives me a better surface to, to preemptively work with. So I'm pretty excited about doing it on the cardboard. He's still going to have to use a bit of plaster. Oh, yes. I mean, I'm laying the plaster to it now. Plus, it has... Uh, I, even though I, I smashed it uh, or broke all the corrugations, um, it still has some, some unnatural deviations in it that that will have that plaster will have to fill in. But they're subtle, uh, like where it heads up the edge of this grade. I couldn't keep that from not producing a crack there, the kind of dark spot where the water is soaked in. I could not get it to not produce some bit of a crack. Uh, I even cut the back side a little bit to make the ease, but a couple of spots to try to make it perforated, to make it curve. Uh, also, this would not be flat. I couldn't put it down. I couldn't make it off the layout. Did you overlap the top layer? Because you can, you can cover the edge with the plaster. Right. That's what I plan on doing up at the top of the grade. I'm not going to patch it all in until I get my road bed, uh, until I lay the track on the road bed. So I took the road bed off and then, uh, I'm going to patch the rest of the road into this at the top later. I've, and working with plaster, I've done that before. Can't build a section of road with plaster, stop at a point, come and add back onto it without any problem. Now, the foam core, every time you, you leave a gap, it leaves quite a natural space that is really hard to get to lap. You have to fill it with something. But I think... All right, what you got for us, Johnny? Uh, Marty down uh, Australia. Make an Arduino applicator with Wi-Fi for the plaster application. Uh, there you go. And you won't have to touch a thing. That's right. Except the buttons. <laughs> I don't want to automate it all, and I I, lo I love the scenery stuff, and I didn't before. I mean, uh, this is the 13th layout I've built in my life, and I've got a lot more scenery on this layout than I've ever had on any layout before. Now, I've had layouts with, with all the track work complete many, many times. You know, Plywood Pacifics are not that hard to do. This time around, I wanted to break that mold for myself, and I forced myself to get into scenery and structure building much earlier the, in the process. And that worked great for me. Uh, it, you know, some people, the best technique for some people, especially if you're on your first layout, I don't disagree with the idea of build all the bench work, lay all the track, run all the wire, ballast all the track. Do, you know, I'm not against that philosophy for everyone. Some people, it's a great technique. Depends on the size of the layout, depends on how many layouts and what works for you. For your first layout, I think that's probably pretty good advice. I would agree with track player on that advice for a lot of people for a first layout. I don't like working with that because I get too bored. I just, I get bored doing it that way. Well, I found the best way of doing my layout for me and it was recommended by someone who has a fairly large layout. You do, do it almost like Joe Fugate saying the Toma uh, build. You do a section and, and then sort of scenic it and move on and scenic that and move on and scenic yeah. it. Um, you, you have to do your bench work first uh, and lay your track and make sure it's working. But before you start doing scenery and, and do it all, your whole room is all white. And then you lose interest because you don't see an end to it. That's right. I always have. I've always got bored with every layout because of that, because of the process that everybody always told me to do years ago. And when I started this layout about three years ago, I didn't have a name for it. You know, thank, thankfully, Joe Fugate and his team have given us a name and a, and a formal thought process behind doing Toma. But I knew I wanted a modular layout. I did not want it to be portable. I didn't care about portability, but I did want to build them in sections so I could take them down. And I basically built mine using Toma. Uh, you know, I built a module at a time, and as I got to a point where I wanted to build another module and add some scenery, I did. Uh, I love that technique, and it just 
it's it's a little more fly by the seat of your pants, a little more. Although I think it's a good idea to have a good plan going in. Have your grand, somewhat of a grand plan. Be flexible. Be willing to change it. But have somewhat of a grand plan. And then have a plan for each of a couple sections. And get going. Because the biggest hindrance to most modelers is they, they sit in their armchair for a decade without, you know, it's a... a Analysis paralysis, Mike Coughlin has said. I've heard other people say they just they, and I'm a I tend to overthink things, as you know. Uh, and and when I just decided, I just I, I took a, a couple sheets of styrofoam, I started cutting them up, I built a couple modules, I knew how, how that wanted to go. And as much as I've thought and rethought my plan, I wouldn't do a lot different if I was going back and build those modules I built two or three years ago over again. My first module had ground foam on it. I went back and covered that up, but, you know, in worst case scenario, if I despise those couple modules, I take two modules out, uh, it costs me a couple sheets of styrofoam and some time to completely swap them out. Versus right. if it was a permanent layout, coming in and hacking up all that wood, saw, you know, sawing all of it out to tear it out, I'd be much less, uh, I would be much more unlikely to do that. Jerry Ashley says 12 inches at a time. Oh, well, that's a, what's that, T-Track? Uh, T-Track is basically is a, a modular standard that builds these quite small little square modules. Yeah. Um, but if that suits your purposes, my modules, I've got a couple that are eight feet long. So, you know, they're not meant to be portable. And if portability matters, you've got to plan I, that in. I think he's talking about doing the scenery. One one foot at a time. I just sure. want to share my secret for making models work. Exactly. Uh, tell Robert hello. How's the Ozarks? He's probably out on his boat having a good time. The cardboard, too, I mean, that tends to go, I mean, it's a lot easier to get a smooth surface. What I always had a problem with building up forms is you always end up with these wrinkles in it that are mostly unnatural. It happens a little bit with concrete, but anybody that, that's worth their weight, a state road crew putting down a road years ago, wouldn't have had a lot of that uh, rippling that happens with a spackle blade uh, or with a, you know, with a putty knife that I tend to get a lot of when I'm using forms, where it's using the and we'll see how, how it truly works out in its entirety because I haven't done it with cardboard, but I do like I do like the initial process pretty well. Well, I, I kind of like, although it, it takes a bit of space and, and you have to use the tape that they provide, I kind of like the Woodland Scenics uh, roadway setup sure, where they have, they have the stick-on tape that you put on either side of your road, and it's basically the depth of the plaster you're going to put down in between right. and you do, you, do, you do it with a, a spatula or or what do you call it um Green. a putty night yeah right and and once it's done you pull the tape off you have cur the the like the road bed is a little bit higher than the the ground around it you fill it in with gravel sure Ralph, and not the checks in the mail thank you appreciate it <laughs> No, seriously. <laughs> Whoever well, thought of it. It is a good system. It works. We use it on the Toma layout when we built that for yeah. train masters. Works great. Well, it's the same technique that's been used for decades and decades and decades. The technique that I always used was plaster, except that we used regular plaster, whereas the smooth that is more like the, the uh, what is that? More stuff? like the 90 that Ralph's talking about. It's smooth, easy. It's, it's long working time, you know. Sure. Yeah, so it's it's just it's just a better suited plaster. You could go buy the Durabond ninety or, or something as opposed to buy the smooth it, but the you know the you know the, they've it, got a complete system. It is it is sandable that Durabond ninety. It's just a sure. little harder harder than you're used to, but hey, if it works, but it they've works. got a complete 
system from road markings to the the flexible tool that you could lay out on the road and flex to get your your dashes down the lines right I mean, they have a no, they use they they have now uh marker pins to put the lines down yes felt markers yeah. which is the way to do that I mean, i've marker. got some of the adhesive uh some of the adhesive striping and uh, again in the background it's not a problem. It's thin enough. It's basically a decal sheet. It's thin enough in the background. If it's right up in front of you at eye level, like much of my layout is, I can see that height. I can see that at, at a, a painting the lines are just, uh, it's a requirement in my book to paint the lines on. You so talking. All, you haven't touched it all on dirt roads, but real quickly, I just want to say something about it. If you're going to do a dirt road, I don't care if you're doing an HO or O, I don't know of any of the gravels, any of the ballasts, any of that kind of stuff that's fine enough to be good in scale. I think you've yeah. got to go out and get real dirt. You've got to get the finest sieve that you can find and yeah. sift that stuff out. I, I found something, Miles. Okay. I don't know. I don't know whether you have it down there where you are, but up here in Canada, every time they... Uh, remove a building and they take concrete out. They separate the concrete from the rebar uh -huh. by vibrating it and yes. crushing okay. crushing it all to bits. And then they'll reuse that crushed concrete as screening for road roadways and so on. Yes. Well, they did our street here the other uh, a couple of years ago. I went and got a five gallon pail, and I sieved it to four different sizes, and the one size is so perfect mm -hmm. and once i had it done for like a gravel road i took some sandpaper to where the the tires would have worn it and it yes. looked perfect yeah that's what i did as well i used brown i'd say fine dust you can't I, I i say i don't know of any of the gravels or any of the ballasts that are fine enough it's got to be something that you sift out through a yeah. really fine sieve to get it down small enough because if the problem is in, in fine scale modeling, you put that scale vehicle on the road and all of a sudden the rocks is as tall as a tire. Yeah. 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 Oh, I used, I what used an old, way, old nylon yeah. stocking to sieve it. Yeah. I used That's what I used. Yeah. So yeah. I do the stocking, ball it up and push it through. And I, I even see if I use unsanded grout, but I, uh, so it doesn't have the large sand particles, the little small rocks. It's just the pigment and the and it's Portland cement, which is which, you know that's the yeah. primary, which is a quite fine uh, uh, concrete material, a high carbon footprint because the production process is fairly involved to make Portland cement. But I still run it through a stocking, and rub it through a stocking to get it quite fine. I even use the stocking to apply it on the road, and I, I even think the application method matters. If you pour it on and then pour water on it, it causes it to it. A process oh, happens to it. Yes, but if you put glue down, uh, put adhesive down first and sift it into it, you get a natural, a slight irregularity in the way those granules form. And it, for a gravel road, absolutely perfect. Uh, for a dirt road, I'd do the same thing. I would just sift uh, the dirt to get something real fine for a dirt road. Although I'm wanting to do uh, this seal, I haven't done it yet. Uh, take some of the fine dirt, throw it in a five-gallon bucket, let the silt float out of it, collect the silt, do the same process a couple times, and you get that silt material, which is like on uh, coal mines and strip jobs, um, uh, the uh, surface mining operations, they have silt pot, and they screen those silt pods, and they do the same thing at coal prep plants. They float the coal out and, and silt it to take that fine, fine coal uh, which is high quality off the surface of that float material but it's and it, it, so it's all about floating it and water is not always the best material to float that with you need something it has to do with potential gravity of water so water's potential gravity is a hundred the equal buoyancy uh, or the natural buoyancy of water is uh has a natural gravity of a hundred if you get something up around 160 uh that the lighter fluid uh, which you're better to buy naphtha in a gallon because you buy a gallon of naphtha. But it's the same thing that you get for Zippo lighter fluids. But if you buy a gallon of naphtha, you buy it for about the same price as you can uh, 
paint strippers or uh, acetone or, or any of those other materials. You buy a gallon of naphtha, but it's lighter fluid and it has a potential gravity typically of something like 160. So it floats things much easier and use that to make your sealed. Just don't smoke around it while you're doing it. Well, no I, have kidding. To, I, have, I have to earn my check too. When you go to paint that blue on your layout, be sure and use scenic cement because it's nice and thin and it covers nice and smooth and then you sift your stuff into it. Sorry, I just had to do it. <laughs> oh, I, I'm not a, when it comes to really. glue, when I don't use uh, like Elber's white glue for much of anything that's visible, uh, I don't like it on wood structures. I like wood glue quite well, but I, standard white glue, um, I've used it some in areas that are completely unseen that are structural on the layout, but Mod Podge uh, or, or Scenic Cement, uh, which is a matte medium, uh, I, I think it's just a matte medium. Uh, and there's there's a difference in those two, and I, I think matte medium is just, it's just, and I like the Mod Podge product real well, but I think matte medium what you got Johnny uh, we got Brian here uh, back when y'all were talking about fine stuff uh, he says silica dust will work well uh, they use it to thicken up the uh, epoxy he said that's as fine as flour mm -hmm. silica dust is that, that's not the stuff they use in sandblasting though right uh, sandblast is if you use silica sand that's what you end up with yeah okay after stuff. it's been blasted okay what i what i've done with a lot of stuff too is i i just go out in the backyard i have a, a steel plate and i put my concrete or whatever it is and i smash it with a hammer yeah when i run it through uh i run dirt through uh i've got a coffee grinder dedicated to the layout i often run yeah right a little bit of a couple spoonfuls of dirt in there and shake it while it runs through. Dirt's you one can... thing. If you're going to put stones in there, the you're going to kill the blades really quick. Uh, Brian, I know, said, but if I... Brian said, no, it isn't. Uh, it has been uh, pulverized. The right silica which sand. Is what you, which, which is what you get after you use it for sandblasting. It's mm -hmm. been pulverized. Well, I thought I would try that with various, like the decomposed granite that I used to make ballast with, leveling sand that everybody's heard me talk about that before, that I sift out to make my own ballast. Um, and I found a, a mortar pestle. That's like a thing you'd see at a pharmacy always, that uh, yep. a bowl is the Port mortar, the Latin word to contain, and pestle, which is the stick, which is the Latin for to make powder or something like that. Um, mortar and pestle. Um a handy modeling trick you can buy for 10 bucks and you can pulverize or break up anything and i got better results using the mortar and pestle doing leaves here lately i busted up leaves and a lot better results than i did with the uh using the coffee grinder on my leaves because i was i've got a small food processor i would prep the leaves and i'd run them through a coffee grinder but they often get quite too thin and you get just too much powder and not enough, you know, particulate leaf flake. And use mortar and pestle, I got a much better result with the leaves. Yeah, so that stays wet for about an hour and a half. Can you say it right? If it sets up in an hour and a half, probably for a little longer to say it. Then, I you, can, you can actually, in a half an hour, you can come back and, and smooth it out a little bit. You can actually work with it all the time that it's curing, but because it's the type of material it is, it's gonna it's gonna get hot because of the it cures. It doesn't dry. Right. But I've always worked with plaster of Paris. I built roads with plaster of Paris for years. That worked. That worked great. No problem. I'm also curious how the staining effect happens with, with it being not. You know, you always, when I made roads before, they were an eighth inch thick or something. You were applying a stain to the to a depth of plaster versus it being on the, whether the cardboard will have an effect on the staining process. Yeah. Well, Durabon 90 is not a far stretch from, from Hydrocal. Well, that's what this is. I, I it's almost, big old it's almost the plaster. same material. It's almost yeah, the same material. They, they put stuff in to slow it down. Right, right. And I've tried everything. I've got a bag of plaster of Paris. I've built all the rocks that I've got all the layouts so far, uh, all the uh, rock cuts and, and cliff lines so far have been done on a plaster. Although I am going to give the, uh, uh, 
the Bragdon uh, geodesic fold um, a shot here soon with that fold material. So you that goes. But right. But so far, they're all made out of plaster, all made with plaster of Paris. I've tried everything to slow that down, including the uh, the vinegar, which is just awful. Don't try it. It doesn't work anyway, and it smells horrific while trying to work with it. Uh, uh, to, I did the, even though this uh, 90 I've got uh, Dura 90 I've got in a habit of of uh, water adding the the powder to it quite or the the plaster to it quite slowly just I've got a habit of doing it that way that extends your working time a little bit but this stuff is still I mean that's over 30 minutes and it's still as soft as as it ever was and if plaster of Paris I mean it, it would be set up in the bowl. This is still just about as thin as it was when I made it. And you did it's follow the instructions for mixing, right? Nah, I probably didn't. <laughs> he didn't read course, the instructions. Typical of male. Of course I did. Oh, there was instructions on the box. <laughs> nah. Just add it to the water. It's plaster. How different can it be? And and I've never found uh, you know, people ask me about the scenery goop or the ground goop, rather, about the exact mixture for that. It varies. I just, I have not found an exacting mixture that works for me. It just depends on the humidity that's in the room at the time. It, you know, the materials all vary so dramatically. The vermiculite sometimes soaks up paint like crazy. Sometimes it just, it, it doesn't at all. But, um, and it varies depending on the stuff. Well, well, I've got the road material. I got the road material planted for the the street. We'll give a shot uh, next time to actually planting. I've, I've got, I'm going to want to try it on the front where I can get to it quite easily and show you guys in a much easier way. Before our next show, I'll have the base uh, for the back the back couple structures I built completed. We'll put you know plant that and talk about some of that. I really want to get into detail on some of the detail parts, it's like Miles showed on his layout. Detail is the difference between anything close to high fidelity modeling or fine scale modeling and just not. Details are the things that if something is missing, if you look at a scene and there's something and it doesn't look right, the lack of detail or the lack of dirt and grime is probably the first thing that's off-putting to you. So thanks for hanging out with us tonight, guys. Thanks, Miles. Ralph? Thank you. And you got me dirty, Ralph. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Go wash your hands. Pump some but water. you didn't put your you didn't put your hands in it. That's the only <laughs> thing. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. We we'll, we look forward to seeing you guys back the first of the year, uh, where we're going to put a few of these things together. We've done a few separate things now. We're really going to put those together the first of the year and uh, and bring a scene home with the because I've got these couple structures. We're going to close this thing up and bring a complete scene to get a photo at the end. Thanks, everybody. Merry Christmas to everybody. Yeah. Merry Christmas. Take care. All right. Thank you, Andy, Ralph, Miles, for the show. Uh, yep. Hope everybody appreciated it. Uh, everybody seemed to be interested once you got off on the roads and all. Just want to say go to uh, utmallbuilders.com. There you can check the schedules for all our uh, shows, Tuesday and Wednesday shows, or at. Uh, 8 o'clock Central, 9 o'clock Eastern Time. The uh, Thursday and the Saturday once a month show with Bill and Big Barry. Uh, <laughs> I said that one backwards, Big Bill and Barry. <laughs> but uh, those are at uh, 9 o'clock Central, 10 o'clock Eastern Time. Be sure and uh, click on the e-mag and sign up for an email notification. Uh, when it comes out, uh, the next issue should be coming out uh, somewhere around mid-January, something like that. So uh, be sure to sign up so you get notified when it comes out. Appreciate everybody coming in tonight. And like the guys on the show said, hope everybody has a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And the Fine Scale Show will be back uh, next year. So stay tuned. Same time, same channel. All right, bye all.